no way of knowing who should be for us. But God knows. And if we wait upon him, isn't it funny how it stirs the devil about God telling anybody else but the person? And I think how that Abraham sent his servant out there to get the, the companion of Isaac. What if Isaac had been like some of us? Whew! Well, he never would have got Rebecca. There are righteous men over the earth. And there may be a lot of cultism and a lot of wrong things going on in this earth. I know that. But it doesn't eliminate the genuine, my friends. It doesn't eliminate the fact that God can still walk with, with him. Men can still walk with God today like he did in the Old and the New Testament. Yes, sir. Amen. When I was a boy, I read, I saw the story of Peter Marshall. And I saw, it challenged my heart so much. I think he's one of the greats. And I read that sermon in Mr. Jones Meets the Master entitled uh, Spiritual Research. And in it, Peter Marshall said, now listen to this. Peter Marshall said he had never known anybody who had ever really put God to a test. That is, not tempting, but who had ever really taken, for instance, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. He said, I, Peter Marshall said, I don't know anybody. And Peter Marshall knew a lot more people than, you and, than, than all of us. He said, I haven't known anybody. He said, why don't people take this and do like a scientist does with a hypothesis and just sink their teeth into it and stay with it day and night? Till God delivers his promise. I was a boy, and whoa, my heart was so sort I was telling my son about it last night. He, he hadn't, he's, he's old enough now to, to tell these stories mean something to him. Because it was in 1965 that I met the man of God, Robert Morgan. He was, he was born that year. 19, who led me to Brother Ham in 1966. But way back in the 50s, I say, oh, Jesus, is there anybody, anybody like Peter? Is there anybody that could hear from God because God spoke to Peter and saved his life? Lord, have you spoken to anybody else in this generation? They got a hold of me. You know, Peter was about to go over the precipice and, and, and he heard a voice with his ear say, Peter, and he stopped. He went to his knees and as he felt in the dark, he would have gone. There'd never been a Peter Marshall, United States Senate chaplain, never would have been. God said, Peter, stop. He stopped. I said, oh, God, is there anybody in the world that can hear your voice? And I said, oh, God, then in 1959, somebody gave me a book entitled Rees House, written by the great C.T. Studd, or uh, Rees House, uh, written by Norman Grubb, who also wrote the book C.T. Studd. And when I read that, I said, oh, God, is he yet alive? And I found out he was dead, and I said, oh, Lord, is there anyone today alive that walks with thee? Do you, do you realize what I was praying? I was praying to deliver, deliver, deliver me from evil. Me's in there, you know. You get that? Deliver me from evil. Why? I'd seen nominal Christianity so long that I was beginning to sicken of it. I could hear men get up and say that, that uh, this and that and the other, and I found out God wasn't leading at all. That no man that I ever met, for sure, and my dad had the same, hun same hunger that I did. I couldn't find men that knew definitely that God was leading and God was speaking. It was always guesswork in hindsight. I said, oh God, there's got to be somebody somewhere that knows when you speak. I knew there were a lot of fanatics across the land. I knew that. A lot of fanatical people. I knew that. But I, I wanted to stay away from that. I just want to find somebody that was genuinely and humbly walking with God. So I read that book and walked the banks of the Mississippi in 1960 and said, Oh God, if there's a man on earth that walks with thee like the men of the Old and New Testament, I want to meet him before I die. And from 60 to 66, I'd ask the question, Do you know anybody that walks with God like the men of the Old and New Testament? I'd ask, Well, no, they couldn't give me an answer. Not one of them. And then I received a phone call in 1965. My father said, son, get up here. There's a man up here that we've been waiting to meet. You and I have been wanting to meet all our life. His name is Robert Morgan. Brother, I got, when my dad ever calls me on a phone like that, I'm on my way. And away I went. 
I heard this man preach. I heard the gospel come alive. I saw he, he did not have a fanatical spirit. I saw he wasn't critical of anybody. And it stirred my heart so wonderful till after service we were o- over, the, over the table instead of getting to the television set. We were eating um, a, a, a wonderful meal. We were talking about the things of God as if, as if it were no more than saying, pass the coffee. Not that it was desecrated. I don't mean that. I mean that kingdom talk was common instead of worldly talk. That meant something to me. Everybody else I'd ever been acquainted with, when you got home, you you let down your hair uh, hair and played tricks on one another and told jokes that were not quite dirty but had a lot of shade in them. I didn't care for it. It didn't spell holiness to me. It didn't sound like Isaiah 35 to me. Especially when I'd hear them criticize other ministers or get after the Catholics or get after the, the high church people or the low church people or the charismatics. It didn't sound like Jesus to me. Boy, I met a man that wasn't like that. Boy, I'm telling you, I got up to him. I said, Robert Morgan, do you know anybody that walks with God like the men of the Old and New Testament that hears from God in this day? He said, yes, I do. Well, I said, who is he? Where is he? I want to get to him right away. I said, his name is Lauren Ham. And he's a Methodist evangelist. That was my first shock, Methodist. <laughs> well, have we forgotten that Luther was Luther? <laughs> well, I know he was Catholic, but they didn't accept him. St. Francis was Catholic. He was Christian. Luther was the beginning of the Lutherans, and Wesley was the beginning of the Methodists. All of them were men of God. This man was a United Methodist, a Methodist evangelist. Well, I swallowed. Aren't you glad that my doctrine didn't keep me? Aren't you glad that I wasn't more filled with ideology? Think of it. Oh, this is why I was praying. Deliver me from evil. That's what I was praying. Oh, God, if you don't help me, I'm going to run into consequences I don't want to run into. Lord, I need to find somebody that walks with you. I never got a positive answer for six years. Oh, I knew there was an old timer in the church of God by the name of E.E. E. Byram and our home is named after him now because the Holy Spirit said, call it the E.E. E. Byron place. I knew he walked with God, but I had to find somebody alive. I need to see a present day demonstration of truth, a living reality of the precious truth of God. I want to see somebody that loved everybody day and night and never said one word, one slanderous word. Deliver us from diabolos. Deliver us from our adversary. What does it mean? Slanderer. Had to find somebody that slander didn't come out of, that criticism didn't come out of. Of course, criticism is a first cousin to murder. And Cain was critical before he murdered Abel. Somebody that loved everybody and accept everybody. Somebody that demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit. I wanted to find somebody like that. And think of it, in all these almost 15 years, I've yet to hear him utter one word of criticism about anybody. And I've been with him more than most men. Maybe in some ways more than his own children. Ben had a great privilege. Boy, he was calling me this morning, praying, praying this morning that old-fashioned conviction would fall on us. He said, oh God, let the conviction be increased. See, this is all in my life. Deliver us from evil. And then think how important it was, my friends, because I had, hadn't walked with God long enough to hear His voice, though I was a saved person, and I did have the witness of assurance. Just think how important it was that I prayed for five weeks after I resigned from St. Paris, couldn't get any answer from God, and one day said, Oh, God, I don't know where this man is that walked with thee, but Lord, your God, you tell him that I'm in need in St. Paris, and I need him to pray with me. And boy, before six hours was up, ring-a-ling, ding-a-ling, the phone rings. Son, I'm in a public phone booth. God said, call you right away. I said, yes, sir, I'm in great need. But what's on your heart? Well, I, I need to get out of here, Brother Ham. The skids are on. Daddy said to me when I resigned, son, don't you know you're not supposed to resign until you got some place to go? I said, Daddy, God told me to. My dad said, well, then fine. That's what you're supposed to do. God told you to do it. Why did he say that? Because the carnal church had put the skids on Stephen, what do we do for you when you resign? How big was the offering? Uh, over $2,000. Uh, did we put the skids on you? No. Not at all. What, what, what did we do for your wife? 
We kept her in the apartment and paid the bills till she finished her teaching. And when he came back to teach the choir, we paid him 50 a week. That's the way you're supposed to live in Christianity. And brother, I tell you, I had to have something that wasn't nominal. Something that didn't put the skids under the preachers when they resigned. Brother, you ought to turn them loose reluctantly. Turn them loose if God says so, but do so reluctantly. And never let that relationship be interfered with. As far as I'm concerned, every man of God I've ever met is a, is a man that I love. And my relationship should never be broken. Robert Morgan's still the same. Lauren Hill's still the same. These men of God are still the same, only they're much deeper and much closer to me than when we first met. So he said, well, I said, Brother Ham, I need to go. The chairman of the board said, I need to get out of here. I said, I don't have any place to go. He said, well, he said, do you have a list of churches? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, we read them to me and let's see if God speaks. Church number one, church number two, church number three, church number four. No, no word on any of them. Church number three was Moorhead, Kentucky. I think church number four was Fayetteville, Tennessee. Church number five, I don't remember, but church number six was Scott Depot, West Virginia. The only place, the only place where we could, we, well, I didn't know anything about it other than Robert Morgan said, you might want to put this on your list to pray about. I didn't want to go there and try out. I didn't want to, I didn't want to see what anybody looked like. I didn't want them to tell me about salary. I didn't want anything. I'll tell you one thing. It isn't worth it to be a preacher or anything else unless, unless God really sends you there. I'm not interested in your money. I'm not interested in your setup. I'm not interested in any of that. That was my attitude. Because, listen, I was sick and tired of nominal Christianity and hypocrites. I was tired of it. I need help from God. Thank you, Father. So I said, I don't even want to put my name in until I know God wants me to go somewhere. And got right down there with Scott Depot, West Virginia City. I heard him say, Hallelujah. Well, he didn't know what this place looked like. He, he may have been like me. I thought it was a place up in, up in the mountains where the train didn't stop anymore. It is a place in the valley where the train doesn't stop anymore. And, and, a, and, a, and a congregation of maybe 20 to 40 people kind of clinging to the hillsides. That's what I thought. And proverbially speaking, maybe a little shorter on one leg than the other. That's what they told me about West Virginia. All I'd ever seen was uh, poverty over the TV. I'll tell you what, it didn't make any difference to me what it was. I said, God in heaven, oh, glory to God. So I said, I'll just, Brother Ham, I said, I'll just write it down. I wrote it down. Call, call my dad's friend. I, I didn't know John at that time, but Daddy did. And he, John loved Daddy. I said, John, would you recommend me to Scott Depot, West Virginia? Boy, and then John said something funny to me. Now, you know, I want you to think about this. He said, Oliver, I wouldn't recommend my worst enemy to that place. They chew preachers up and spit them out in little pieces. I wasn't phased. I said, but Brother Connolly, God's just witness that's a place for me. Would you submit my name? You don't have to tell him what God said, but would you put my name in? He thought a minute and he said, well, well, he said, I'll tell you what, I don't know you, but I know your daddy. And on your daddy's reputation, I'll put your name in. That's what he said, daddy. Then he said, don't say I didn't tell you. I never have. I've never said anything to him about it, except thank you, Brother Conley. And we didn't come into town with a roar. We came into town with a squeak. Scared to death almost. Because I'd met carnal boards. I'd met people that's supposed to be for God. First man I met in this place was a successful businessman. He had the light of God on his face. Had the love of Jesus in his voice. Prayed with me at a hospital and praised God. And I thought, Lord, what in the world have I got here? God had given me a person that was hungry for Jesus. Now, can you see how this fits in? This deliver us from evil. That prayer started back when I was a boy. See how important it is? God, get me out of the consequences of nominal Christianity. It's tearing me to pieces. I'd rather be an old sot sinner any old day than to be a professor. I'm hanging on to God by faith. I'm in great need. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. But I have a hope in my soul that lies beyond the grave. I've got a promise of God that he's going to take me through. He's going to do for me what I cannot do myself because I'm still praying, lead me not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So it's Scott Depot, West Virginia. No man knew where she was. We couldn't find her on the map. 
So we drove all the way into West Virginia before we found it. Isn't that wonderful? God brought us here. And that brought us to you and spared me the consequences of being in the wrong place and with the wrong people. I talk straight to you because you're my sheep. I talk, I talk straight to you because you're my charge, my responsibility. If you please, from all the elders, our responsibility. And oh, what a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, I'd like to go on on that note, but I've got to mention one more thing, and then I'll close. This deliverance, you see, when he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that's a Hebraic parallelism. It's poetry. And it's very poetic. And most of the time, it merely restates what's been said before, but just in another way. But the restatement says more. Because we're never really finally delivered until death. The great Lutheran scholar wrote this. All moral wickedness is referred to when you pray this petition. And pain and distress only insofar as they may injure our souls. We're praying that we'll be delivered from all moral weaknesses and pain and distress only insofar as they may injure our souls. Thus, the deliverance we ask, while it includes rescue from wickedness throughout our lives, really asks for deliverance from the entire wicked world by a blessed death. We're praying for a blessed death. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Final deliverance comes at death. Blessed are they that die in the Lord. And so this petition is a petition for heaven. This petition is a petition for a better place. This petition is a, is, is, is a place where, to take us to a place where there are no consequences of sin. This is a petition when we'll leave any part and all of the sinful nature behind. And we enter into that blessed abode where we can thank men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rest. Terry has, has read me a sermon here this last week. I wish I had it to read in closing. It was so wonderful. Have you got that? Oh, bring it up, Terry. Show me what to read. Isn't it something? He had the book with him. I want to read this in closing. Because this is talking about final deliverance. Okay, how far? Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Terry said he felt like he ought to bring it this morning. This is my brother Terry. He, he's a man that walks with God. See, he felt like I ought to bring it this morning. Just think, right here at the last of my sermon, I was asking God to help me. Here, he's brought this wonderful thing. Now, I want to read you a little bit uh, before we close here. Now, I was going to try to get out at 12, but I didn't make it. So you bear with me while I read this. You, won't, you don't want to miss this. God's helped you, brother. This is good for us, Terry. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, I felt God when I was preaching there a while ago. I felt Jesus help us. I pray the Lord will lift the burden off of the very sensitive in the place so they'll just be glad in their heart. Because Christ is helping us and leading us. Unworthy though I was, this is a man who found himself in full deliverance. Heaven itself. All unworthy though I was, I found myself in the king's country. After the sorrow and strife and gloom and discard of earth, how bright and fair and tranquil seemed this heavenly land. When I recovered from my first transport of joy and was able to think again, I remembered some of those great souls of the Bible and how I'd hoped that one day I might see them in heaven and talk with them. Meeting one of the great angels, I said to him, Where should I find Abraham, the friend of God? For I wish to ask him about that sacrifice of Isaac on Mount Moriah. Answering me, the angel said, pointing to a great avenue, Take yonder highway of the nations and follow it till you come to the sea of glass, mingle with fire. Then turn to the right until you come to the river of the water of life and follow it till you come to Mount Zion. And on the other side of the mount, you will come to the throne of the Lamb. And just near the throne of the Lamb, in the inner circle, you will find Abraham. He had a dream that he went to heaven. 
this great preacher. I thanked him. Then I said to him, where, where will I find Joseph? I, I'd like to talk with him. To my surprise, he gave me the same directions which he had given for finding Abraham. Then I asked for Moses, for I want to talk with him about Mount Pisgah, and Samuel, for I want to talk with him about Saul and Elijah, for I want to ask him about what he said to Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, and David, for I want to ask him about the Psalms, and Isaiah, for I wanted to ask him about the 53rd chapter of his prophecy, and John the Baptist, and John the Divine, and Peter, for I want to ask him about that special and private appearance of Christ to him after the resurrection. To my great surprise, the angel gave me in every instance the same direction he had given to find Abraham. I thanked him and started on my way. Presently, I came to the highway of the nations, and at once I began to understand the meaning of that great passage of John, how he said, they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Here so often, what we see is the shame and the sorrow and the crime and the dishonor of the nations. But there I saw the glory and the honor of the nations. Israel, Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, Spain, Russia, Germany, Britain, and America. Following the highway of the nations, I came at length to the sea of glass mingled with fire. And there the sight was so beautiful. And the music of the harpers harping with their harps so entrancing that I uh, well might not for, I might have forgot whether I was going. But when the music ceased for a moment, I remembered and went on my way till presently I came to the river of the water of life. There too I fain would have remained and rested under the shade of the tree of life, listening to the gentle laving of the river of the water of life. But pressing on, I saw before me Mount Zion. And passing over it, I came at length to what I was sure must be the throne of the Lamb. For there was a rainbow of strange and overwhelming glory hovering about the throne. And here in front of the throne and in the inner circle, just as the angel had told me, I found Abraham and Joseph and Moses and Samuel and Elijah and David and Isaiah, John the Baptist and John the Divine and Peter. They were all listening with rapt and eager countenance to one who was speaking to them as he stood there between them and the throne of the Lamb. I wondered at first if I could understand what he was saying or if the language of heaven would be strange to me. But as I drew near, I heard familiar words, for it was Paul who was speaking. He told again the story of that day at Damascus when Christ appeared to him. I heard him pronounce again that beautiful lyric of love. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. I heard him say again, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I heard him say again, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I heard him say again those words which were more than any other than he wrote and spoke and spoke explained the grandeur of his life. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. At that, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Samuel, Elijah, David, Isaiah, John the Baptist, John the Vine, and Peter sprang to their feet. And with David, the sweet singer of Israel, leading them in all heaven, angels and archangels and all the blood-washed company of the redeemed, joining in the song, they sang together unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. With the burst of that triumphant song, I awoke, and lo, it was a dream. But a dream which by God's grace will one day come true. Will you too be there to sing with Paul and Moses and David and Isaiah and John and Peter and all the redeemed of God that song of redemption? Can you say now, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That one thing that he taught us to pray, if prayed sincerely, will cause us to have this great benefit forever and forever. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Shall we stand?
Oh, Jesus Christ, seal this to our hearts, we pray. But Lord, before it's sealed, open it and deposit it that we may truly be able to pray. L lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Again, would you turn to Jesus paid it all? All to him I own. Sin hath left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. As we're standing in the presence of God, just do what God tells you to do. got a lot of ideas about what we want to be like and what we want to do and how it ought to be. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus knows how it ought to be. I, I was determined this morning to preach differently than what I did. But it seemed to be the more I was determined, the more he was going to have it another way. Yes, sir. Yeah. Until I was out preaching like an old-time camp meeting preacher. <laughs> But what came, out, what came out of my heart, rapid fire, yes. came out in sincerity and in experience and came out under the, under the pressure of the Holy Spirit. It's a desperate age. I like to be a nice preacher and I like to talk softer and I like to do a lot of things. But I'll tell you, this petition is so desperate. He wanted me to talk a little more uh, in a way that was uh, commensurate with, yes. with the seriousness of the tone. I'm telling you, we're going to have to look people in the face. We're going to have to look God in the face. And there's victory in this. God wants wonderful things for you. If you're waiting and you're trusting God, don't let the devil push you. You just wait and look to Jesus. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled in this certain way of life that's really not the old Bible way. Then let the Lord convict you about it. And in that conviction, let the power of the Christ take all out of you that is unlike him when the devil flees the slandering spirit flees when the devil flees the critical spirit is gone when the devil flees the nagging spirit is I mean, when god comes in the nagging spirit's gone 
You can be injured and injured and wounded and injured and it only makes you shine more beautiful and come out more glorious. That's the kind of religion I'm looking for. That's the kind of man I hope to see. That's the kind of man I want to be. And I'm not. But he, I've got a promise that I will be. I've got a promise by God's wonderful grace that he will do a work within me that I begged him for. Meanwhile, I have to exercise self-denial and lose my life over and over again because a man can lose it and then pick it up again after God's blessed him. I can't do it. I can't do it. Drove up to the home the other day and saw what a beautiful place it was. And I remember telling Linda, Linda, this saying has no touch on me whatsoever. No clinging to me whatsoever. I drove up and thought of my conversation with her. You were with me. Now, you took me home. Yes. And I said, Stephen, it's still the same today. It has no touch on me whatsoever. If God were to will it, we can move to a trailer. Yes, sir. If God were to, it's in his hands. Yes, sir. Jesus, it's, it's in your hands. But I want to tell you something. It wouldn't do our critics any good. If we got in a trailer, they'd say we failed. If we get in a nice home, they'd say we're, we're a gangster and we take everybody. It doesn't make any difference to the carnal mind. I tell you, a man just has to put his eyes on God and do what Jesus said. Love everybody and go on. Pray for old-fashioned conviction, old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival to fall upon us. I tell you, it's a wonderful way. It's a wonderful way. My prayer is that God will cause us as a people to respond to his voice. If we can begin now, or we can keep on listening to his voice. Then down beneath the cross, I lay my sin sick soul. For not have I to bring, thy grace must make me whole. Would you be seated while we're praying at the altar?
come and sing. I sure want to thank the Lord for His direction and His help. <clears throat> and I guess maybe I'll never ask for the prayer that I asked today. I had a minister and his wife to call me for counseling this afternoon. And they said it was very pressing, so I set up a counseling session for this afternoon when I get home. And I said, Jesus, if it'd be possible, could you just let me out at, at 12 o'clock? It wasn't possible. And the Lord will strengthen us and help us in the session. But you see, we're still trying to obey God. <laughs> Hard for folks to understand that you can't push God around. Hard for folks to understand that you can't tell God what to do. Not if you're going to be a true servant. Not if you're really going to be in the kingdom of God. Another thing I want to thank you for is a <coughs> letter that I received from my secretary. She's been my secretary for almost a decade. Her husband brought it to the board of trustees meeting the other night. I wish I had it for you to read. I think it's one of the tenderest, sweetest, kindest, and most encouraging letters that's ever been put in my possession. In essence, she said, Pastor, we came here years ago because we were trying to escape nominal Christianity. <coughs> Paul spoke of nominal Christianity when he said that in the latter days they would have a form of godliness but would deny the power thereof. She said, we came. She said, the Klein family have been changing little by little. She said it was because of those little changes that Dick and Sally saw what was happening to our lives. And because of those changes, we have this beautiful pianist, this wonderful man, his wife, who are artists, musicians, but most of all, servants of Christ. Because of the change in our life, we're here today. Then she said something else. She said, in essence, don't feel bad about preaching the way you did last week. She said, we needed that. She said, the load's off of you now. It's on us. She said, all we can do is say, Gee, where we find ourselves short, is say, Jesus, forgive us. And then walk in the light that he has given us. These are not the exact words. Her words are more beautiful than mine. It was such a loving touch from a person that had worked with me nine years. So it gave me great encouragement in the middle of the week because my heaviest load is upon me from those who have been with me the longest. That they may be as brighter, brighter than the new converts. And her letter told me that her heart was young and fresh in God. And then I recalled hearing her on the telephone. She probably opened up her conversation like this. Hello, Brother Hogue, or Pastor Hogue. It was on the third word that I heard she belonged to God. The third. Jesus witnesses the third word. Never happened to me before since. She spoke three words. Probably something like this. Hello, Pastor Hogue third word I knew that she was anointed from the throne of God that she loved Jesus it gave me great encouragement this week it gave me great help for my soul because if I'm to have victory after 12 years you're to have victory after 12 years we can at least slay, say with Job, if we've had hard times, though he's slain me, yet will I serve him. We can at least refuse those critics who really don't know our own heart and say that I know that my Redeemer liveth and I know that he's called me to walk with him. But oh, how important it is for a pastor 
to have this kind of reflection. It did my heart good because you can work together for nine years and think less of one another. You can't work for nine years and let a human frailty get in the way. Either way you go. But in the kingdom, you can work for 19 or 99 and be more thrilled with the things of God than when you first started. These are the people I'm looking for. I thank him that God has given me, you, in his name, in the church of the living God. Blessed Christ of beauty was veiled off from human view, but through suffering, death, and sorrow, he has rent the veil. benediction. Now receive a benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.